Arundhati Roy, first of all, a declaration. We all love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. And we're glad that you're back here. To have you here once was a dream, and now it's pure gluttony. Now so. it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was, I mean, I've been just gripped by Ministry of Utmost Happiness, reading it with my little daughter on my lap, which has made it all the more powerful for that reason. Um, and it really explores India's fault lines and goes through all of them, as Naomi was pointing out. And it lets us in, though, through the lives of people. It lets us into these big movements. And it seemed to me it's like the Japanese art of kintsugi, of a pot that is broken and then welded back together with seams of gold. It's, um, I guess it's the art of embracing damage. And so this, they say never judge a book by its cover, but I do want to judge this book by its <laughs> cover <laughs> because it's got the solidity of stone, but also the lucidity of marble. And it's got this flower here that refers to the god of small things and a little fly. So can you tell us? How's it felt returning to fiction after 20 years, but obviously informed by everything you've written in between? Well, you know, I mean, fiction returned to me. I just, I just had to learn the art of waiting, you know? I never, I mean, I never felt, and I have never felt, and I do not feel that fiction should ever be a product. It's something too, powerful for me. It's a prayer mm. or a song and, and I can't, uh, you know, just do my duty by it. So um, it, 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 it came back to me initially, these characters came knocking at my door and then kind of stayed on and then moved in <laughs> and they just, they, they just um, colonized me completely. Um, but, you know, obviously, after I finished writing The God of Small Things, there was a, it wasn't just my own thinking about what I should be doing. What happened was that within months of my being on the cover of every magazine uh, as the Booker Prize winner, not necessarily the author of The God of Small Things, but the Booker Prize winner, you know, the, the face of the global Indian, um, the Hindu nationalist BJP came to power and immediately conducted these nuclear tests. And I was not in a position to keep quiet because mm. if I had kept quiet, I would have been on that train. You know, it would have been assumed that I was on the train. So I, I stepped off and, and, and wrote the end of imagination. But what happened over the last 20 years was, was that while, you know, obviously that created a, a huge hostility towards me from, from the people who had the microphone mm. and therefore claimed to be the nation, there was a, a, a journey that began into these fault lines and a, a, a deepening of my understanding. And, and, I, and I did feel that you know, I was not prepared to write a domesticated book, mm. a book that was frightened of, of anything at all, you know, not of intimacy, not of politics, not of mass killing, not of transgressive loves, not of anything. Because I think fame can domesticate you, markets can domesticate you, bestseller lists can domesticate you. So you got to be sort of sidestepping that. Yeah. Contracts and big advances can domesticate <laughs> you, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, mm. I, I wanted, I felt like a sedimentary rock that was just, uh, each of these places I went to and wrote about, I knew that the, you know, when I wrote a political essay, it's an argument, it's an immediate intervention in a situation that was closing down in India, yeah. closing down on the most vulnerable people. So yeah. there was a purpose, there was a moment. That 
it was a weapon. Blow that space open. But each of those journeys, I knew that fiction was building because there's so much more that was complicated. And mm. so if the non-fiction is an understand, I mean, is, a, is an argument, fiction is an offering. Mm. Uh, fiction is a universe. Mm. Fiction is an invitation to walk through those streets, yeah. uh, you know, uh, stop and smoke a cigarette with mm. the smallest guy and mm. say, what's up, what's going on, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you really feel that through this collection of eccentrics and misfits that you introduce us through through the book. But also, I mean, I wasn't prepared for this either, but it's a really funny book too. <laughs> I don't know how that's even possible, but, um, and also somewhere I think what I, what I really loved was being guided by poetry and music and languages. There's Urdu, there's couplets, there's, and I don't know, uh, can you say a little bit about poetry? Because it starts almost like, you know, this epitaph is an epigraph with the, the great uh, Turkish poet uh, Nazim Hikmet, which uh, it basically says, I mean, it's all a matter of your heart. And then you have Osip Mandelstam, you have Leonard Cohen, you have... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, you know, th that was the other thing, you know, there were two things in terms of writing that that I wanted to do you know one is how do you how do you look at the form of a novel and 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 use every possibility that it offers you mm. so that this isn't a novel that wants to be a film this isn't a book of contemporary history that uh, you know is pretending to be a novel it's not a manifesto that you have some ideology and you're animating the characters. It's really like a city. It has, mm. it has form, and then that form is ambushed, and yet it still has form. And it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not an accretion, but it's a circu circling around itself. It has yeah. a structure. It's an Indian city, because it's suddenly somebody city. will build something where they're not supposed to. Yeah. And then you have to just yeah, let that happen. Yeah, it's an Indian right? city. It has unauthorized <laughs> colonies. It has illegal immigrants. <laughs> it has dogs and cows and creatures and bats and vultures that have yeah. disappeared and all of that. Uh, it's a porous Indian city with yeah. with its own plans. So there's a guest house in the graveyard and where something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There are porous boundaries between the living and the dead, between the human and the animal, between women and men between Hindus and, you know, there's a, there's a sort of incendiary border running through all the characters. But the other thing was what you mentioned about language, because every day we wake up and any of us who lives in Delhi for sure, you know, at any given time you're speaking so many languages, hmm. you know, speaking in Hindi and Urdu, you're, you know, in Jantar Mantar there's Telugu and Malayalam and there's so much and how do you, kind of absorb those cadences without becoming gimmicky, you know, without producing pidgin English like the colonials, because I think it actually deepens your language, mm. knowing so many languages, you know, so there are characters like Dr. Azad Bharatiya, who, tr who, 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 who has his manifestos and he's on a 17 year hunger strike for world peace and he, makes his pamphlets, but he translates them himself. And I'm sure I've met so him. He's got these yeah. little photocopied or, uh, papers you stuffed in polythene bags or, that he's weighted <laughs> down with yeah. stones. Yeah. Someone told me they thought that I was him. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, but uh, or Comrade Revati, who was one of the comrades that you saw in the film, who writes a letter from the forest, and she says, I'm a Telugu-speaking woman, and yeah. sorry, my English is not good, but her English is grammatically wrong, but it's actually so beautiful, mm. because more beautiful than if it had been correct, yeah. you know, not less beautiful yeah. for what she knows and what she says. Yeah. So, so it is, like, I do feel that I just mm. live in a, in, a, in a sky where fragments of poems and songs and languages yeah. and... Uh, you know, they're just floating in the air and just reach up and grasp them every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is that beautiful down. line you have from Neruda, in what language does rain fall on tormented cities? Yeah. And that's one of in our guides languages? again. And, and of course, in that, uh, in that chapter, yeah. which is a chapter about uh, 
about a place in Delhi called Jantar Mantar, where all the various dreamers and idlers and resistance movements gather, progressive as well as regressive, as well as crazy. It's one lot are sitting there with these hospital masks over their faces and have promised not to speak until Hindi is declared the national language. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But, but there's also some naughty couplets in there. <laughs> there's, there is some naughty couplets. Are they found, made up? <laughs> which, which one's your favorite? What did you make up? What did you find? One of them, I won't tell you the one I made up. <laughs> 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 but uh, there's one... Um, there's one, this particular gentleman, Dr. Azad Bhartia, who's a character I'm very fond of, who's, who's been fasting for years on everybody else's behalf, on the pavement. And he's a scholar and he's a bit, you know, he has every day, he, every week he pr publishes his news and views. And, and, and there's a baby that appears on this pavement and then suddenly disappears. And, and the police who know that he knows everything that happens on the pavement, sort of beat him up to get some information. Even they, do, they don't beat him up wholeheartedly, <laughs> just, you know, the Delhi police way, like just a bit. In passing. In passing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the only thing he, he says to the cops when they ask for information, I'll say it in Urdu first, he says, Mar gai bulbul kafas mein, keh gai sayyad se, which, which Naomi is a climate change poem, basically, to me. It means, it translates as, she died in her cage, the little bird. These words she left for her master. Sir, please take the spring harvest and shove it up your gilded ass. <laughs> Climate change poem for Naomi Klein. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> so I, I really do want to actually, I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience with questions for you. And I think if we can prepare a roving mic to sort of be handy. And, but I'll, I just want to ask a, a question or two of Arundhati. I just wanted to prepare you that we are going to do this. Um, and also, we are going to take some live questions, but some by Twitter, because, you know, someone might send us an interesting question. <laughs> um, and, and so God. if you tweet at Indian Summer CND or hashtag where worlds meet, uh, we'll see if something comes up there that we can pick up from as well. And then we'll end with the book. And then we'll end with a reading by Arundhati. Yeah. But I, I, as you digest the profound questions that will come out and prepare them, I wanted to ask you about animals because that struck me. I mean, poetry, of course, was one, but animals are, of course, the first subject in art in any cave painting going back 25,000 years ago. They're the first thing that humans create. So, but there's so many animals in this book from vultures and crows and Pyle, the white horse that we all saw, and even a, a little dung beetle lying on his back, like hoping to hold up the heavens if, it, if they fall. Um, and you've got your own Hilti and Marty, <laughs> I do. two beloved hounds. So can you tell us how, where animals play a role in this? Well, I mean, yeah, the, the, the book is full of, of creatures and animals and geckos. And I, I guess, you know, I grew up in a, in a little village, the village that the God of Small Things is set in. And in my growing up years, there was Nothing, you know, there was no shops, no restaurant, no cinema hall, no toys, no nothing. There was us and the creatures and the river and the fish. And I knew every beetle, every worm, every tree, every bird. And so I just can't, I mean, my eyes fall on creatures, you know. I, I mean, I, 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 I can't see how human beings don't just see themselves as one of a whole lot of species, you know, mm. and feel so profoundly superior to everything. Because uh, the, even in a city like Delhi, it's polluted, it's filthy, it's, I love all that. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the animals just are there. 
like every ste step on the staircase to my flat, there's, you know, there are yeah. creatures. Yeah. There are, there's a dog called Chadda Sahab, which is <laughs> the name of a decent chartered accountant. <laughs> and I think, I think he's a metrosexual because he has a girlfriend who's called Comrade Lali, who, mm. who, who kind of has always got these corpses of parakeets or bats or <laughs> cats. And he just looks at us and says, do we really have to? I mean, they do <laughs> feed us, you know, <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> so, and there's so many, I mean, there's a, there's a, one, I mean, one of the people in the book who's, who, who you see in the film, the, the, the guy on the horse, he, he's a character who calls himself Saddam Hussein because he actually uh, is a Dalit, uh, a, a person who comes from what were formerly known as an untouchable caste, and he watches a mob beating his father to death for transporting cattle. It's happening every day in India now, if you read the papers. Uh, and and, and in, in anger, he converts to Islam, and he has this video on his phone of Saddam Hussein's execution, and he very impressed with the disdain Saddam shows for his executioners. Yeah. So he's called Saddam Hussein, and he uh, has his horse, and he only rides through the city on a horse. And one of his businesses is that he stands at these traffic crossings in Delhi where people feed pigeons. So he sells the pigeon feed, and these motorcyclists who think it will get them some, you know, blessings, yeah. feed the pigeons, and as soon as they leave, he takes the food back <laughs> and resells them. And resells. So, you know, and he yeah. has a thing about creatures, and so eventually the graveyard and the guest house, it becomes like a Noah's Ark full of rescued yeah, that's what beasts and humans and <laughs> yeah. all kinds of things. It, that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, we could talk forever, really, because there's so much to see. But is there a question to start with from a real human being? That, uh, and is there, a, is there a mic that's wandering and maybe we can... Thank you so much for uh, putting together this awesome event, Siresh, and the Indian Summer Festival. Thank you so much, Naomi Klein, for this amazing introduction. And it's really an honor to meet you, Arundhati Roy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Um, I come from Syria. I was born there, and I lived my whole life there until um, as a result of the war, I had to leave my country and I arrived here as a refugee two years ago. We have a saying in Arabic that says, Yulad al-shu'ara min raham al-shaqa. Poets are born from the womb of suffering. I was listening to you and it resonated to me and I immediately thought about this saying and all the things that I learned in my culture. And it seems to me that suffering is what made you the poet that you are. And maybe this can also explain uh, why that person that we are referring to that is meeting in another city is as far as he can from being a poet because he has never suffered anything. And that's why he is persecuting a lot of people, including my people. My question to you relates to the book, but not directly to the book, but what would you say to Syrian people? What would you, what is your advice to us to find at most happiness? I, I mean, I would not be able to presume that I could offer advice to a people that have been devastated the way Syria has been devastated, you know, and I, um, I, I just sometimes think, in fact, there's a part in the book where, in this book, where one of the characters who's a Kashmiri says, you know, how, how easily a country can just cease to exist, you know, suddenly. So, uh, about suffering, they were not wrong. Mm. <laughs> but the thing is, this, uh, you know, I think, I think perhaps, uh, you know, the, the idea of an artist and suffering may not be just personal, 
you know? It may be that people who are writers and poets live in the world without a skin, and therefore they, they don't know where their happiness ends and other people's begins, where their suffering ends and someone else's begins, because you feel on behalf of more than just yourself, you know? So uh, I don't want to claim any great suffering on my own behalf because I have seen what horror people are going through, you know? So I can't claim that. But, but to see that, to watch what is going on around me in India today uh, is, is just not, it's, it's, it fills you with terror to see the tide of absolute wickedness rising from the bottom, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really terrifying thing to watch because it's not, I mean, frankly, the real problem here is not, is not good enough for us to blame the guys who are meeting just now, you know? The thing is that they have been put in that position by a system that has gone terribly wrong in very different ways in India and in the, in the US, but it's not about individuals. Can we have a question in the back, please? Can we, there's a hand up in the back, so. Thank you, Arundhati. I am impressed about your story of the creatures. I am in love with fruit trees. So I consider every person is a fruit tree. And I think Canada is a fruit basket, not fruit salad. But your novel is a lot of fruit salad. And is working with the grassroots and dispossessed people. My question is, what, what role could elders play? Because it seems, I know Naomi has met the Pope. I don't know whether you'll meet the Pope. But <laughs> I was wondering, because uh, there are a lot of elders who are creating problems like in Washington and Delhi. But also, there are elders like the Mandela group, which, and the uh, women who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you think they have any role or they are a burden to us? And, and my question is about the youth in India. What role do they play in, the, in justice? Thank you. I don't actually believe in these categories of elders and youth and so on, you know. Like they're not homogenous categories that have separate ways of looking. So I don't think um, we need to um, think about elders as somebody who's out of, out of the wheel of what can be done and what, what cannot be done or said. You know, so uh, yeah. I mean, we we should just we should just think of what can we do, and I think Naomi is the one who's writing about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. Okay, we've got a question on Twitter from Harsha Walia who says, "Can you comment on how fault lines migrate to the diaspora?" Well. You know, I mean, the fault line of caste for sure um, goes, seems to go wherever the Indian diaspora goes and is practiced. It, it has migrated to Pakistan where caste is practiced. And of course, uh, as we know, the, the, the rising tide of Hindu nationalism right at the front lines are the diaspora who, I mean, in India, it's a joke for us. Like whenever you s see someone writing a virulent letter saying Pakistan should be nuked, the address is most likely to be Champagne Urbana or something, you know? <laughs> so they are, as we know, and yet I know that so many people in, in the times I've been traveling through the US and, and here, uh, it's, a, it's also a myth that's sp spread that every single Indian middle class person is a Modi supporter. I, I can personally vouch for the fact that that is not true because 
uh, there are so many who have stood up and, and so many who at one point were, uh, were, were very responsible for actually creating a situation where Modi was actually banned from coming to the US. It was only after he became prime minister that suddenly his CV seemed to have changed and the, hmm. you know, he was allowed in. Right. Is there a question on the side? There's a question. Marco, right up front on the side here, I think if we can get a mic there. We might have to, after this, there's just time for one last question before Arundhati reads again. So. I only heard about you about two hours ago <laughs> from a friend named Pia. And I was absolutely enthralled. I had to get here. And I begged them to let me come in because I do, I've worked with Native people for about 35 years in this country. And my question really has to do with um, what many Canadians never seem to understand, as they don't in many countries, about what has happened and what is happening to Indigenous people in this country. And being half black and white, I've had the, I mean, the amazing uh, history to have lived through the civil rights movement in the States. And when I see what's happening in the States, you remind me of Angela Davis, who is my mentor and an amazing woman. <laughs> and Naomi Klein, and the women in this world that are doing what they're doing is to me so critical and important. Uh, I try not to use the word capitalism, but I will use it. Please use uh, it. I think it is, I think it is, uh, I think it is something that is fundamentally flawed, and I have yes. supported so much Naomi Klein for what you are doing. But we have to look at land and where this land came from. 150 years in this country, I am enraged when I recognize that, you know, Indigenous people have been here for thousands of years, and we're not hearing that on CBC. I get so angry. <laughs> and so I just want to thank you. I don't even know what question I have. I just want to <laughs> say God bless you. Thank you. For writing what you're writing, and I am going to read your book. <laughs> and but I, I, I do want to say something about this vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in India. So the, when you saw the film, if you saw the comrades at the end, they were all indigenous people, okay? So, so what is happening in India right now is that huge swathes of the lands of indigenous people have been signed over to mining corporations, old story. But in, in, in India, they are fighting back, and they are fighting back sometimes with arms. And so, of course, they are being called terrorists and all of that. But um, the interesting thing is that, you know, when you talk about women, the front lines of struggles against displacement by big dams, not only by indigenous people, but mostly, but I'm just saying all the villagers that are being displaced by dams, by mines, by infrastructure projects. One of the great things about India is the great resistance movements, which are all fighting with their backs to the wall, but they have actually pushed, some of them have pushed the biggest corporations out. And uh, many of them are led these struggles are led by women. I mean, I know uh, when uh, 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 at a dam site they went and dumped 10 truckloads of stone on a farmer's land and 10,000 women picked it up and put it in the collector's office and said, next time it'll be in your house, you know? <laughs> but, 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 but what I want to say is that for instance, I, I went inside uh, the forest, I, sp I, I spent time with the gorillas, and inside the forest, there is an organization called the Krantikari Adivasi Mahila Sangathan, which means the Revolutionary Indigenous Women's uh, Organization. It has thousands of members. They're all fighting displacement, basically. But the NGOization of the feminist movement has made only certain feminist issues feminist. And any movement that threatens the economic order is not considered feminist. 
So there's a sort of professionalized feminist movement, and then there's a revolutionary feminist movement, which is not considered feminist. But women are out there fighting. Half the guerrillas that you saw in the People's Liberation Army, half of them are women, you know? Yeah. We um, have time only for one last question, and this comes from Trisha Dulku, and it returns to the book, and she asks, names have a lot of power. What made you choose Aftab and Anjum as the two names for your protagonist? Well, it's, uh, it's explained, you know, the, the Anjum, uh, oh, I didn't, I think, oh, yeah, it is yeah. there in the film, right? So she says, my name is not Anjum, I'm Anjuman which means I'm a gathering of everybody and nobody. So, yeah. But um, shall I yeah. end with the... I think it would be nice. I <laughs> shall end with a brief reading about creatures. <laughs> this, is a, this is a chapter called The Tenant. And um, it starts with a quote from Jean Genet, which says, Then, as she had already died four or five times, the apartment had remained available for a drama more serious than her own death. And uh, the person I'm going to read about now, she's the other, one of the other major protagonists. Her name is Tilotama, S. Tilotama. And she uh, basically is on the pavement with all these people when, the, when, when a baby appears on the pavement, abandoned, and Nobody knows what to do with it. All the wisdom of the resistance movements and the people's movements and the ideologues and everybody finally doesn't know what to do with a baby. There's a, the Kashmir mothers of the disappeared mm. don't know what to do with a baby that has appeared. Mm. And finally they call the police and when the police arrive, the baby has gone. And Tilotama has just picked her up and run. So this is about her. The spotted owlet on the street light ducked and bobbed with the delicacy and immaculate manners of a Japanese businessman. He had an unobstructed view through the window of the small bare room and the odd bare woman on the bed. She had an unobstructed view of him too. Some nights she bobbed back and said, Moshi Moshi, which was all the Japanese she knew. Even indoors, the walls radiated a bullying, unyielding heat. The slow ceiling fan stirred the scorched air, layering it with fine, cindery dust. The room showed signs of celebration. The balloons tied to the window grill bumped into each other desultorily, softened and shriveled by the heat. In the center, on a low painted stool, was a cake with bright strawberry icing and sugar flowers, a candle with a charred wick, a matchbox, and a few used matchsticks. On the cake, it said, Happy birthday, Miss Jabeen. The cake had been cut, a small piece eaten. The icing had melted and dribbled onto the silver foil colored, covered cardboard case cake base. Ants were making off with crumbs larger than themselves. Black ants, pink crumbs. The baby whose birthday and baptism ceremony had been simultaneously celebrated and successfully concluded was fast asleep. Her kidnapper, who went by the name of S. Tilotama, was awake and concentrating. She could hear her hair growing. It sounded like something crumbling, a burnt thing crumbling, coal, toast, Moths crisped on a light bulb. She remembered reading somewhere that even after people died, their hair and nails kept growing, like starlight traveling through the universe long after the stars themselves had died, like cities, fizzy, effervescent, simulating the illusion of life while the planet they had plundered died around them. She thought of the city at night, of cities at night, discarded constellations of old stars fallen from the sky, rearranged on earth in patterns and pathways and towers, invaded by weevils that have learned to walk upright. A weevil philosopher with a grave manner and a sharp mustache was teaching a class 
reading aloud from a book, admiring young weevils strained to catch each word that spilled from his wise weevil lips. Nietzsche believed that if pity were to become the core of ethics, misery would become contagious and happiness an object of suspicion. The youngsters scratched away on their little notebooks. Schopenhauer, on the other hand, believed that pity is and ought to be the supreme weevil virtue. But long before them, Socrates asked the key question, why should we be moral? He had lost a leg in weevil World War IV, this professor, and carried a cane. His remaining five legs were in excellent condition. <laughs> Airbrush graffiti sprayed on the back wall of his classroom said, evil weevils always make the cut. Other creatures crowded into the already crowded classroom. An alligator with a human skin purse, a grasshopper with good intentions, a fish on a fast, a fox with a flag, a maggot with a manifesto, a neocon newt, an icon iguana, a communist cow, an owl with an alternative, a lizard on TV. Hello and welcome, you're watching Lizard News at nine. There's been a blizzard on Lizard Island. <laughs> the baby was the beginning of something. This much the kidnapper knew. Her bones had whispered this to her that night. The said night, the concerned night, the aforementioned night, the night here enough to refer to as the night when she made her move on the pavement and her bones were nothing if not reliable informants. The baby was Miss Jabeen returned. Returned, that is, not to her. Miss Jabeen the first was never hers, but to the world. Miss Jabeen the second, when she was grown to be a lady, would settle accounts and square the books. Miss Jabeen would turn the tide. There was hope yet for the evil weevil world. Thank you. Thank you.